be ashamed. This poor child cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies. The Son of God surrounds His saints. He will deliver them. He will deliver.
Amen. Can I testify? Go ahead. I know a couple weeks ago I told you guys doctors had given me a poor prognosis, and I just wanted to just give the Lord honor and glory where honor and glory is due. And when I saw the physician this Wednesday, I had had blood work done, and he can't recant my diagnosis, but he can say my blood work looks amazing. So I am, and I told him, just keep waiting. It's coming. It's coming. But God is doing what only God can do. And I have to thank him for that. So you guys keep praying. He's moving. (laughs) Magnify the Lord with me. Amen. Give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. Exalt his name forever. He's still our healer. That choir was singing last night on that outside service. They said, Jesus, his name is healing. His name is power. His name is life. There's power in the name of Jesus. And I'm thankful for the wonderful name of Jesus. Thankful this morning that he is faithful. He's proven himself faithful time and time again. Before I bring the word this morning, Gracie's going to come and sing for us. Just listen to the words of this song and be reminded of God's faithfulness this morning as she sings. Come on, baby. She forgot her words. I want to welcome AJ back. Of course, Mom and Brooke as well. They're feeling better, but especially AJ because he chased me down with a Christmas tree cake. (laughs) Thank you, buddy. If you have felt the dark of night Questioning what is out of sight He is the answer, He is the light If you have felt the weight of sin Bound by the shame that tempts you in He'll break the chain
great is his faithfulness. No temptation has taken you such as common to man, but God is faithful. Amen. Great is his faithfulness. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm thankful that no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, no matter what we stand up against, God is faithful. He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's our very present help in time of trouble, our refuge from every storm, strong and mighty tower that we can run to. I'm thankful for the faithfulness of God. How about you? Amen. Turn, turn with me this morning uh, to First Kings, or excuse me, Second Kings, chapter number six. Second Kings, chapter number six. You want to keep your Bible open there, and we're going to take a text. You can turn there if you'd like, or you can just look up to the screen for our text. It's going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter ten, and verse number ten. But we're going to be looking at the story. I have my sound text all confused up there. We're going to be looking at the story in 2 Kings, but I want to take this text out of Ecclesiastes 10 and 10. How many appreciate the sound booth this morning? Amen. Appreciate the work that they do back there and uh, that we do back there. So give me, some, give me some props, too. I work in there every now and then. But we're so thankful for, for everything that causes the church to flow and to work. We don't just show up and it just happens. There's work that goes into it, preparation that goes into it. I appreciate those that come and clean the church. Appreciate those that uh, stay after and, and clean up after uh, fellowships and just all that goes in uh, to functioning and working together as the family of God. All of our special singers, our musicians, and uh, those that say, well, I'm just a, I just attend. Thank you for attending. Thank you for being a part of the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord and coming together and worshiping and praising and magnifying Him. As we've been sharing on Wednesday night, it takes all of us to make up the body of Christ, to make up the church. And uh, I'm thankful for each one and honor you today and appreciate your service to the work of the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 10. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. Now, I've heard several stories in, in studying and preparing for this message, and just in, uh, just in general, I've heard stories over the last few weeks, few months, and even years of lumberjacks and people that, that uh, that's what they do. They cut down trees. They fall trees. And, and I've heard on at least two different accounts of men that, one was in a competition, and one was just out there working. And in both instances, as they were falling trees, they had fallen more trees with much less effort than their colleagues or the one that they was coming, going up against. One man got frustrated at the man because he was just putting forth all of this effort, all of this work, and every time it looked over, he saw this other man just sitting there sharpening his axe. Seemed like every time he looked up, he was sharpening his axe. And this other story I heard, the man said that after he would fall a tree, once that tree fell, he'd sit on the stump and sharpen his axe. Then he would take the next tree, and he would do the same thing. And by the end of the day, he had fallen more trees than any of those that were working with him. And why was that? Because he put forth less, less effort and less uh, strenuous activity in others, all because the common denominator here was they focused on keeping a sharp cutting edge on that axe. And understand something about us in our spiritual lives. We will accomplish much more for the kingdom if we will do the same thing, if we'll focus on keeping our cutting edge. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the cutting edge. Let's pray today. Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thankful for those who have gathered to worship you, God, and, and we depend upon your anointing. It is the difference today, God. And I need that difference maker. I need the anointing to be upon me to preach your word today. And they need the difference maker, the anointing, to be upon their ears to hear, their eyes to see, their hearts to receive. And I just ask you to meet with us in a mighty way around these altars. And I pray, God, that you would just bless in the house of God as we endeavor to focus on keeping 
the cutting edge. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're there with me, you can read along in 2 Kings chapter 6. Pretty familiar story in uh, verse 1. This is talking about the, this is from the, I guess you could say the lesser prophet who did not make the list the other night on Family Feud, sorry. Uh, but he was known as washing Elijah's hands. When, when they referred to, for, referred to Elijah, that's how they knew him. When we study Scripture, what did Elijah say? When he was asked of Elijah what he wanted, he said, I want a double portion of the anointing that is upon your life. He said, if you see me when I go, that will happen. He saw him when he went, and it happened. So we look at this and we evaluate the story. Uh, we would think that Elisha was, uh, that their referral to him is just the one that washed Elijah's hands, but he was a mighty man of God. And this mighty man of God uh, uh, had many sons of the prophets that had gathered and it had come to a point that uh, this group was growing in this school. Uh, really, this, this, this school of prophets was growing and this uh, need for them to expand was taking place. And that's where we pick up here in Second Kings chapter 6, verse 1. It says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elijah, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. I mean, it's too small. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place, make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he shewed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and he cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. It's one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, because there's none of us who's ever seen this, never seen iron swim, but it happened. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and he put, it, put out his hand, and he took it. We see here a group of young men, called the sons of the prophets. They were interns, they were students, they were uh, those that were learning under the prophet Elijah. This was a group of young preachers that were studying under him, and so many had joined this seminary, if you will, that they had ran out of space, and they asked for permission and, and encouraging presence of Elijah to be there uh, to begin to expand and begin to build a dorm as they began chopping down wood to build this new dorm, uh, and they began to work on this. Uh, there were several sons of the prophets there. There were several working. Uh, they were several focused. Uh, so when we talk about the cutting edge, we have to understand something here. Losing the cutting edge does not mean uh, that you've missed spiritual activity. These men were very well involved in study of the Word. They were very close to one of the greatest men of God to ever walk the face of the earth. They had close relationship and great respect, uh, and they admonished him, uh, and they desired to be close to him. Uh, recall there that they, he said, Go ye, and they said, Come with us, be with us. Uh, and Elijah came with them. Uh, they stayed close to the teacher. Uh, they stayed close to uh, the one that they could learn from. Uh, so these men were, were not... these. Men Men were not hirelings. These, these men were not backsliders. Uh, these men were not men who uh, were called up, too called up into other things. Uh, but these men were men uh, who were diligent uh, to see uh, the work of the Lord go forward. Uh, and so they began to do a work. There were several of them. Uh, but in verse 5, uh, the story focuses in, it does not tell us his name, uh, but it focuses in on one of those young prophets. Uh, so we want to do that. We want to focus in the one young prophet uh, and very interesting about this young prophet uh, he was a prophet not a lumberjack because he had to borrow his axe 
And it says, it makes that clear that he borrowed his axe. Why? Because he wanted to help with the building project. He borrowed an axe. Man, we can learn something from this young prophet. He didn't say, I can't come and help on work day, cut down no trees. I don't have an axe. He borrowed an axe so he could be a part of the work of the Lord. Have you ever came to church and it came time for the offering to be received and you didn't have anything? and just look at your neighbor and say, can I borrow a dollar? Because I want to be a part of giving, of worshiping. Uh, and, and I'll pay you back because I know that if I'm willing to give. Uh, that was the heart of this young prophet. Uh, he didn't make excuse. He didn't say, I can't do it because I don't have. Uh, he found a way. Uh, so losing his cutting edge uh, was not a fact of him uh, not being diligent. Uh, he was furiously attacking that tree. Uh, he was going after it. One powerful swing after another. Uh, and then he comes with one uh, one more uh, powerful swing. He's wanting to drop that tree. Uh, he is uh, if he is like the French family, they were being competitive to see who can drop the most trees. And I'm the same way, so I can't keep picking on the French family. Me and Draven cannot play games together. We've done that for years. We would be out there if we started out here in these woods. Uh, by the end of the day, it'd be how many trees did you drop? And that, that's the way I'm sure it was. And he was furiously after that tree, one powerful swing after another. Uh, and then we find, uh, can you picture this in your head? I, I don't know if you visualize Scripture when you're reading it, but I do. Uh, and I could see this young man who obviously is not a lumberjack. Uh, he does not probably have uh, the greatest stance and the greatest swing, uh, but he's swinging with all that he has. And when he does, uh, the axe head comes off. How many knows when that axe head comes off, that handle gets a whole lot lighter? And he swings, and the handle goes flying out. Uh, out suddenly, the, it goes out, and the force almost knocks him down. And he looks up just in time to see the axe head, the borrowed axe head, sinking to the bottom of the water. Sinking to the bottom of the water. Splashes there, big splash. And now, as it sinks, he realizes something. His heart sinks with the axe head. Why? Because he realized in that moment he had lost his cutting edge. He lost his power element. He lost the very thing that would make him effective. Uh, he lost the very thing uh, that would cause him to not be able to complete uh, what he came there to do. It was gone. That stick, that axe handle left in his hand uh, was not suffice to finish the work. Uh, and so he had lost that. Uh, you know what? The reality is that can happen to any of us. It's happened to me many times. It's happened, if we're honest, we can all say, amen, pastor, it's happened to me. Can I tell you, it's happened to me, and I, I'll tell you, it can happen to you. I want to give you a warning this morning. Don't scoff or judge or dismiss the reality. Say, well, it happened, happened to me. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. If it hasn't happened, there will be a time that it will happen. You need to thank God that it hasn't happened. Be humble and memorize 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand to take heed, uh, lest he fall. Because we have to remember something uh, about this cutting edge and about losing this cutting edge, uh, just looking at the context of the story. Uh, this young man was not doing carnal things. This man was doing uh, good things. Uh, so you don't have to uh, be out in the world to lose your cutting edge. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in some detail this morning. Uh, what do you do uh, when the sense that you sense uh, that you're losing your cutting edge? Uh, how do you recognize it? Some questions that we want to ask ourselves this morning. Uh, what do we do to overcome losing our cutting edge? Uh, what we should, should we do when we uh, finally got to the place that we did not do all the things that we needed to do uh, to prevent ourselves from losing it, and now we realize we've lost it? What do we do when we've lost our cutting edge? So I want to give you five suggestions this morning. Hopefully I can get them all out this morning for recovering 
your cutting edge. Number one, what we have to do uh, when we realize that we've uh, got this cutting edge situation, we've got to practice a, a regular self-evaluation. Remember I told you the man, he would drop a tree, he'd sit on the stump, and he would sharpen that ax. He would check it. This young man now, he lost his cutting edge. It's possibly because he didn't do that. It was possibly because of negligence on his part. Now imagine that hit, that axe head didn't just fly off the handle all at once. It probably loosened up. I've never had an axe handle fly off. But how many remembers those old ball-peen hammers? Got the big ball on one end and the little ball on the other. I don't remember what we were doing uh, as kids, but probably helping my stepdad do something. My stepdad uh, was a roofer, and he had a very nice big east wing hammer that he roofed with. Uh, but this here uh, particular ballpoint hammer, I, I don't recall why we had it because he had nice hammers. Uh, but I, I could remember swinging that thing, and you could feel it begin to loosen. So you'd swing it, bump it, swing it, bump it, just to keep it on there. And so there was times that if you swung it, swung it, swung it, and didn't bump it, all of a sudden, whoosh, there it goes. So imagine this axe head didn't just fly off the handle. You ever think about the many things that come from Scripture? You ever heard of somebody flying off the handle? I'm sure they come from Second Kings chapter 6. It flew off the handle. When it flies off the handle, it's not good. It had been loosening over time. But he was too busy. What was he too busy doing? Was he too busy drinking it up? Was he too busy partying it up? Was he too busy running around with friends? No, he was too busy swinging. He was too busy uh, involved in the work that he was doing that he did not notice. Uh, that's how life is. Uh, we get so busy with living life. We get so busy uh, with swinging that axe. Uh, we get so busy with accomplishing another task. Uh, and for a while, we drop one tree uh, after another tree uh, after another tree. Why? Because our cutting edge uh, was sharp. But what did the wisest man in all the world say in Ecclesiastes 10 and 10? Uh, that blunt edge is not going to do you any good he said he said you got to wet that edge and what that means is you got to sharpen that edge and you got to keep that edge we can come to church week after week service after service we can care for our children we can maintain we can go to our job we can go through the motions of life dropping one problem after another overcoming one obstacle after another why because that edge is sharp but after a while if we do not have self evaluation Evaluation. Uh, if we do not have that self uh, practice of self evaluation uh, to ensure our communion with God is tight, uh, we may not recover uh, our axe head uh, if we do not maintain it properly. We have to be honest with ourselves. I'm good. I'm good. I'm sharp. See, we need some people to be honest with, her, with us. Like this old lady at the nursing home was years ago, and a friend of mine walked in. It was a, a cold winter morning that was raining outside, and he walked in with his trench coat on. And there was two uh, black ladies there, that wonderful, wonderful saints of God, but they fed off each other. And the one called Mother Ruiz, and, and the other, she looked at her and she said, Mother, look at Daryl today. He's looking shocked. He said, he, she said, he's sharp as a nail, but sharp as a tack, but rusty as a nail. So we can think that we're sharp, but be rusty. We can think that we got it all figured out, that everything is good and everything is tight and everything is right. But the only way that everything is good and everything is right and everything is tight is if you're in close communion with God, with God. We can begin to throw out our titles of what we do at church. But what about our personal time with the Savior? What about our time sitting there on the stump, wetting that edge, sharpening that edge? We can talk about how many trees that we've dropped and how much uh, we've accomplished and how much uh, we've done uh, and how much that we have uh, uh, did for the kingdom of God. I, I've told you this many times over the years of pastoring here. God is not impressed with our resumes. 
Sometimes we go through uh, our time and we step up in the altar uh, and we begin to pray and we begin to try to impress God with our resume because we want him to do something for us. Uh, And it does not matter uh, how many we have dropped. We've got to make sure uh, that we keep dropping them, that we keep uh, stay in the fight, stay in the race. Uh, So that requires self-evaluation. Self-evaluation. People don't, as we said, they don't want to be judged. Nobody will have to judge you if we evaluate ourselves. And if we'll be honest with ourselves, say, I'm not sharp at all, I'm dull. Amen? I'm dull. Have you ever, you know when you're dull. You know, Ecclesiastes 10 and 10 says, you have to start swinging more. It's taking more strength, it's taking more out of you. Has life seemed to be taking more out of you lately than it used to? Might want to check your cutting edge. You may want to to check and see if it's dull. And then sometimes we just have to take a break. Now, the young man, when he lost his edge, what did he do? He took a break. He stopped swinging. At least he was smart enough to stop swinging. He stopped swinging. So you think about this. If he would have just uh, kept on swinging, uh, as you would see this guy there, and you watch uh, as his axe head flies off and flies in the water, uh, and he's there uh, making noise, wasting time, losing energy, uh, beating and banging this piece of wood up against a tree. We see him doing that. We would look at him like he was crazy. Right? There's times that we do that spiritually. There's times that we do that in life, that we're just making a bunch of noise, we're wasting time, we're losing energy, and we're not accomplishing anything because we don't have a cutting edge. We've lost our cutting edge. Our cutting edge is dull, whatever the case may be, uh, but we keep swinging. I, I just need to tell somebody this morning, stop swinging. Stop. We look at loved ones, we look at friends, and we know uh, what kind of friend, what kind of loved one are we uh, if we see someone uh, who is standing there beating a tree with a stick. What are you doing? I'm cutting down this tree. You don't have a cutting edge on that stick. Well, I lost it. Well, find it. Borrow another one, but don't keep swinging. We need to encourage one another, and I want to encourage somebody this morning, stop swinging. He stopped swinging. Uh, We, too, need to stop swinging. If you've sensed uh, that you've lost your cutting edge, uh, listen, this is something that we all got to do sometimes. Take a break. Rest. Pray. Reconnect with God. Reconnect with his word. Reconnect with your family. Uh, Reconnect with your purpose. Uh, You've lost your purpose. Uh, Actually, you've lost your mind if you think you're going to drop a tree with a stick. We've forgotten our purpose. We're just going through the motions. We're just showing up. Uh, And many people are doing that today. What are you doing? Uh, I'm falling this tree. There's no way that you're going to fall this tree. Uh, What are you doing? I'm doing what God called me to do. Uh, There's no way that you can do that. Remember, it's not by power nor by might. You can swing with all of your power. Uh, You can swing with all of your might. Uh, But if you don't have a cutting edge, uh, it's not going to fall. Uh, You can uh, talk to that giant and holler and scream at him uh, all you want and throw rocks at him uh, and take your slingshot and swing it all day long he's not going to fall there's something that has to be behind it's by my spirit saith the lord of hosts somebody needs to know this morning no above all else stop swinging if you've lost your axe head you're not accomplishing anything without his spirit without that sharpness of his spirit number three remember that you're just a steward. Verse 5, chapter 6 here, Second Kings. Alas, my master, it was borrowed. It was borrowed. Remember, that cutting edge that we have, it's, we call it our cutting edge, but it's not really. We can't sharpen ourselves. Iron sharpens iron. The Spirit does it. This was his initial response to the prophet. He ran to the prophet when he caught, lost his cutting edge. I lost master. It was borrowed. He lamented that he lost the loss of the axe head. Why? Because it did not belong to him. It did not belong to him. My calling, 
my anointing, the spirit that is within me. It came not from my ability, not because of my strength. It doesn't come just because I showed up. It doesn't come because I'm swinging. It doesn't come because I put in a tithe check. Uh, It doesn't come because I'm faithful to every service. Uh, It doesn't come by works alone. uh, But it comes by the reality to know uh, that I am just steward. And that's what he realized here, to know that it was borrowed. Someone permitted him to use it. Uh, it, w- it, would have been, it would have been had to be returned at some point. Uh, we know that. We know that everything that God has blessed us with, uh, he's going to give us a crown one day. You know what we're going to do with that crown? We're going to lay it at his feet. Everything is back to him. All glory is back to him. It's all about God. Uh, we are his vessels. We are his workmanship. Uh, we are here for his purpose. Uh, he would have to answer to the owner uh, of the lost act like, Likewise, we are going to uh, have to answer answer to our owner. Uh, We're going to have to answer to uh, the King of Kings for our gifts, for our talents, for our positions, for our relationships, uh, and all of our opportunities. They're not ours. Uh, We're not our own. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20, we've been studying through 1 Corinthians. We're reminded of this. Paul said, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, uh, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we're just a manager. We're just a steward. We're just a trustee of that which belongs to another. And we will have to answer to the Lord for all that he has entrusted us to manage. He has given us this cutting edge. He has placed this cutting edge upon our life. We hear a lot about being on the cutting edge of technology, uh, being on the cutting edge of this, and being on the cutting edge of that. They're in the prime. They're in their prime. They're at their cutting edge. Uh, The only way that we stay on our cutting edge uh, is our dependence upon God. uh, To realize God gave it to me, uh, and if God gave it to me, uh, I still have a responsibility. Notice this. uh, This axe head uh, was borrowed, uh, but the owner did not come by every few minutes and sharpen the axe head for him you borrowed it you're responsible for it when you borrow your neighbor's neighbor's shovel and you break it you're responsible for replacing it not hiding it in the back of your garage and hoping they don't ever come and ask for it again you're responsible for it you're responsible and so he realized that the owner was not coming by to sharpen it but the owner did expect it to be returned. He expected it to be returned. How many knows that God's coming back for what he left? Right. If God, I, I can almost guarantee you, this young man obviously from our story did not maintain, did not check the edge, uh, did not check uh, and make sure that that was on the end of that uh, stick where it needed to be as he was swinging, did not maintain it. Uh, but I believe that he had all intentions uh, before he returned it to the owner of sharpening it, if he got it sharp, right? And if God left a sharp church, you know what he's coming back for? A sharp church. He's coming back for what he left. And so if he has given us, we have access by one spirit into the Holy of Holies. He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. God's gave us everything that we need to do kingdom work. God's gave us everything that you need to kill that giant. God's given you everything you need to do the work of the Lord. He has given you a cutting edge. But God's not coming by every few minutes uh, saying you need to check that edge. Uh, He has instilled within us uh, something that reminds us called a conscious, called his spirit, uh, called the conviction of God uh, that reminds us uh, I have uh, a responsibility uh, in maintaining my cutting edge. Uh, God's given me what I need to sharpen it. Uh, He's given me uh, his word. Uh, God's given me what I need uh, to sharpen it. Uh, Scripture says I Iron sharpeth iron. What does that mean? Uh, He's given us fellowship uh, with brothers and sisters uh, who know that they have a responsibility as well. Uh, We can sharpen uh, one another's countenance. Uh, We can learn one from another. Can I tell somebody something this morning? When you think you know everything, you can't learn nothing. When you realize you don't know as much as you think you know, man, you're well on your way to learning. The greatest teachers are those who never stop being students. 
Never stop being students. I love preaching the Word, but I'm only able to preach the Word because I stay a student of God's Word. I have to hear from Him. I, I, I've often said I'm not preaching it from up here if it hasn't first touched me here and in my time of prayer. Because I realize and I understand that I can get busy, that I can get so called up uh, that I'll lose my cutting edge. I can run after this and run after that and fall this tree and drop this giant uh, and feel like we're being successful, feel like we're accomplishing some things. Uh, but there's just some times uh, that I have to say, I need a break. I've got to rest. I've got to reconnect. I've got to steal away. I've got to talk to God. And this is a hard one for some folks. Ask for help. You're not as strong as you think you are. News alert. You're not 20 anymore. I never thought I'd get to this place. You're not 40 anymore. I have to remind myself of that. Some of the things that I did when I was in my 20s, I probably should have asked for help. Because now in my 40s, my back says, why did you do that to us? Right? Ask for help. And so here he is, this lamentation of this young man to crying out. What was he doing? I lost, Master. Who did he cry? What did he do? He cried out to help. He said this to, to the prophet, to Elijah, to the one that they invited to stay close to him. We want to keep the master. We want to keep the teacher. We want to keep the ones that we learn from. Know who you learn of. Uh, and and you know, uh, he, he tells us that we need to study to show ourselves approved. Uh, he said that we need to, to understand uh, and that we need to be students of the word and we need to know who uh, we we learn from and so there was nothing he could do about his situation there was nothing he could do about it so he needed help now i'm not sure what he expected elijah to do i don't know that he really had an expectation that elijah was going to perform one of the greatest miracles ever performed in the bible but he knew this i need help i need help and can I remind us that's called upon for help? It's not always when we're, that we're asked for help that they need us to fix it. My wife has to, has to remind me of that often. You're not the fix-it man. You cannot fix everybody's problems. As a pastor, we want to because our heart breaks. It's just like watching your children. They said the toughest thing is watching your children struggle with something. You can't fix it for them. Can I tell you that's the toughest thing for a pastor too? To see people struggle in areas, uh, and uh, man, I, I can fix that. I can do this, and we try to give advice, and we try to do this, and we try to do that. No, 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 and nothing seems to stick. So I, I don't know uh, what he expected the prophet to do, uh, and many times we don't know the expectation of those when they ask for help, uh, but we should be honored by the fact that they are asking for help. Uh, and many times I've heard this. I, I know you can't do anything about it. I know you can't fix it, but this is what I do know. Uh, when I call you, you will pray. That's all they need to know. That's why they're asking you for help. It's not because you're fix-it, man. It's not because uh, you're the woman that's got, Wonder Woman that's got it all figured out, uh, that you can come in and save the day. Uh, there is no real, no expectation from anybody uh, for us. Uh, there was not an expectation that Elijah was going to swoop in uh, and save the day. Uh, but he knew uh, that Elijah had connection uh, with the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords. Uh, and he also knew uh, he needed help. Uh, why do we come and sit under the preach word of God? Because we need help, and we believe that the man in that pulpit has got a word of encouragement from the Lord today. I need help, and he's given me help from God's word. He didn't realize what was about to happen, but he did recognize his need for help, and you need to realize that too. You cannot recover your cutting edge on your own. You can't. you got to call on the Lord. You got to ask him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Aren't you glad that he's the God of impossibles? He can do what we cannot do. He can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And we can call on the, the Lord. And as we call on him, he can put, give us the fellowship that we need, the encouragement that we need the accountability that we need. And we call on not just him, but we call on the individuals, godly 
friends, godly family members, mentors, people that we can look to. We, we're living in a time that you can't trust anybody with nothing. Church is so full of gossips that you can't share with anybody your deepest hurts and pains because by the time you get to, if you tell somebody on Monday, by the time you get to church on Sunday, everybody else knows what you're going through. So what do people do? They hold it inside. They keep it inside. There's been people that over the years, they tell me something in confidence. As a pastor, I've learned to do this. When somebody tells me something in confidence, says, Pastor, I haven't told anybody else what I'm telling you. I said, let me stop you right there and let you know. If somebody else hears about it, it didn't come from these lips. They will not hear it from me. So whoever else you told, you better go check with them because they're going to be the guilty party. It's not going to be me. But people need that accountability. They need that one that God has placed to, to give us encouragement, to give accountability, uh, and to know that we've got to get into the place that we can't be too proud to ask for help. But be careful who you ask for help. Y'all you know, notice something. He didn't go to one of the other sons of the prophets. He didn't run to one of his colleagues. He didn't run to the guy that was there dropping the tree beside him. And he definitely didn't run to the owner of the axe. But he did go to Elijah. And he went to Elijah. We might want to consider that. I just want to tell somebody something this morning that you need to remember. If they'll talk about somebody else to you, they'll talk about you to somebody else. Understanding that this man realized he needed help. But don't just share your problems with everybody. Don't just share your problems with everybody. Don't bleed on just anybody. No, no, that there are those that will come that has come to encourage you and not talk about you. There's those that love you, that want to support you and want to help you and encourage you. And that's what this man knew that he had in Elijah. And then you have to examine yourself. Final thing this morning. Elijah responded to this young man's cry for help. Don't you hate it when somebody responds to your cry for help with a question? You come to them and you say, I need some help. I need some advice. They say, let me ask you a question. Where did it fall? Where did it fall? Amy gets aggravated with me. She's telling me, I, I, I don't know where this is at. I've lost it. I said, it's right where you put it. She don't like that answer. But nine times out of ten, it's right where she put it. And that's what Elijah said. Where did it fall? But we remember what we see here in the story. The question required the young man to look back. It requires him to retrace his steps. It requires him to think about his situation. It required him to examine himself. It required him to, listen, you're not responsible for what happens to you, but you're responsible for how you respond to it. And so far, this young man has responded well to what has happened to him. Now, there are some things that led up to it that we've talked about that he probably should have done differently. And I noticed something about Elijah here. He doesn't say, well, why didn't you tighten up the axe head? Why didn't you keep a closer look on it? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do that? He said, where did it fall? Where did it fall? So this required this young man to begin to think about it, to begin to visualize it. We don't want to relive some things, but sometimes we have to examine ourselves to say, where did it fall? Take the time and take the trouble that it takes to examine yourself and say, where is my cutting edge? Why am I stuck here with just this axe handle with no cutting edge? And then, where did I lose it? When did I lose it? And what should I do now? Most importantly, how do I get it back? You hear those questions? Where is it? Where did I lose it? When did I lose it? And what should I do now? And how can I retrieve it? How can I get it back? How can I get it back? The reality is there's those of us that are here this morning, we got our cutting edge. 
I'll say that you got your cutting edge. Because I'd have to be, if I'm being honest, I put myself in the category of there's some of us that we got a cutting edge, but it's a little dull. We've dropped one too many trees without taking a break, without sharpening it. And sometimes it's not our trees, it's not our problem, it's not our situation, it's not our giants that we're dealing with. We're helping, 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 and we've taken no time to stop and sharpen our cutting edge. So there's some of you that's there with Pastor this morning, and then there's some of you that, if you're honest, it went flying off the handle. And when it flew off the handle, you flew off the handle. You're on edge. Why? Because you realize that you've been going through the motions, that you've been swinging a stick with so much force, and deep down inside you know it's going to accomplish nothing, but for some reason you keep swinging because you actually believe that nobody notices that you've lost your cutting edge. If you walk back here in this woods and they were cutting down trees and there was a guy swinging a stick, slapping it up against a tree, you'd know real quick there's no head on that axe handle. And hopefully we'd stop him and say, please stop, stop, stop. I want to tell somebody this morning, stop, stop. Stop swinging. You think you're accomplishing something, you're accomplishing nothing. You've got to realize that you've lost your cutting edge. Where did you lose it? When did you lose it? What should you do now? And let's get it back. And that's what the prophet said. It required a miracle for this man to get his cutting edge back. This story ends with a miracle. In closing this morning, Elijah threw a stick into the water. And then that axe head started to float. That's what it said. I've never seen that happen. But that axe head comes up off the bottom of the water starts to float. I believe the Word of God, don't you? Our Bible tells us the iron swam. The iron swam. God sovereignly intervened to restore this axe head. How many believes that God will sovereignly intervene this morning to what you've lost? He can do it. He can do it for you this morning. But you've got to admit, I'm dull. See, if you admit you're dull, then you can sit down on the stump and begin to sharpen it. So there may be some that comes to this altar this morning, and they're just sitting on a stump, sharpening it. You may want to do that this morning. You know, I'm big about just bringing animation to it. Just come sit on this front pew or come and sit on these steps and just act like you have your axe in your hand and just begin to talk to God as you're sharpening that dull edge. It's just dull. We can take care of that. But there's some that's in a much worse situation. You still got the stick in your hand. You still got the handle in your hand. And you're saying, oh, lost. it's lost. It's not the, no worse feeling than that spiritually. To know that my strength is lost. My power source is lost. You know what we feel at that point? All hope is lost. You need a miracle. But I want to remind you of something this morning. You've still got the handle in your hand. You've still got the handle in your hand. So what does that mean? I've lost my cutting edge, but I didn't want to. I want it back. As you stand with me this morning, maybe there's some that's coming to just sharpen that dull edge, but maybe there's some coming. You may just want to do it. This empty axe handle. A lost master. It's lost. There may be some honest hearts this morning that says, I've lost it. I've lost it. Now, that doesn't always mean that you're totally backslid. But you just have lost your cutting edge, but you're well on your way to backsliding. If you don't cry out to the Master this morning, 
and watch as God sovereignly intervenes and makes the iron swim this morning and restores unto you your cutting edge. You know what that means? He said he would restore unto us. The, the psalmist prayed, restore unto me. Will you not revive us again, Lord? Restore unto us the joy, the joy of our salvation. Gracie gave us some great reminders in that song this morning of his faithfulness and all the names of God. But what did he, she's also saying there, we have a responsibility in that. Trust him. Call on him. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God this morning. As we give this altar call today, I just want you to respond just by simply doing that, responding. My edge is dull. My edge is lost. There may be some in each category. And you say, Pastor, this morning, my edge is sharper than it's ever been before. I'm glad to hear that because we need some prayer warriors when people do respond to these altars to you come and gather around them. And not to remind them of everything they've done wrong, but to remind them that the God that has restored your cutting edge in times past can restore theirs as well. He's a God of miracles today. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we come to you believing that you're going to bring restoration, that you're going to help those that call upon your name, desiring, desiring to get their cutting edge back. We ask you to meet with us around these altars. In Jesus' name. As you come this morning, Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. So I don't know if I want to respond or not. Well, Paul said, prove all things. And hold fast that which is good. When that iron swims, grab it. Put it back on and secure it. Secure your cutting edge today. Will you come? Pray with honest hearts this morning. Let's sharpen those edges. Let's pray for a miracle for it to be restored. Whatever the case may be for you today.